Hello, I'm Jake Stone. I'm Jesse Owens. We welcome you to another episode of Generally Particular, a production of the London Lyceum. Generally Particular is a show dedicated to discussing and reflecting on the whole Baptist story. We are a show by Baptists, about Baptists, and for Baptists, as well as Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and even the Muggletonians and Mm. ranters that may be out there. Mm. I'm a Calvinist Baptist. Jesse is an Arminian Baptist. In the 17th and 18th centuries, we would have been known as a general Baptist and a particular Baptist. So we brought those together in what we think is a fun way to form generally particular. Now, those who are watching this episode can see that Jesse and I are not in our normal locations. It looks, this looks like a hostage video. We are in we are in an undisclosed location, <laughs> trying to be safe from the magisterial reformers who may be coming after us, and even and they, even the new group we've learned about in recent days, Baptist Nationalist. Yes, that's, we're that's, always. I, I tell you, I've learned in the last three years more groups in Baptist life that have been created out of thin air. Than ever before. No, the Baptist. thing is, is that uh, Jesse's in the doghouse, so that's why he's in the basement of his house recording this. Yeah. Um, I am at my friend Zach's place because my Wi-Fi at my house is uh, having issues the last couple of days, and so um, for me, you who may not know, Zach Williams is is a PhD student at Southern, one of my dearest friends. We went to college with each together at William Carey University. But I have something that I think people will find funny that Zach said. When we first started this podcast, I asked Zach if he listened to it. And his response was, I have to listen to you every day. Why would I listen to it even more? Uh, Now, I think that must imply, Jesse, that what you have to say must not mean very much. Um, Mm. so anyway, I am thankful that I can come down here and he lives right down the road from me now. And so we could make this an emergency location. It's kind of interesting if people think about, I have recorded in several places, the podcast, um, because I am technologically challenged. So yeah, here we are. Well, I'm actually in the, uh, I'm actually in the playroom at our house. So I turned it towards this wall so that there weren't toys everywhere, but but again, now it looks like a hostage situation. So maybe I would have been better the other direction. I think it'd be great. You know, we're, we're always in need of funds at the London Lyceum. So, you know, Jesse is in his location to give a plea for not a ransom, but a donation. So <laughs> now we want to start. Today's episode is entitled Baptist Buffet, which means we're going to talk about many things. So um, this is going to be a very unscripted probably short episode so that we don't say anything that would get us in trouble. Um, Did you so want to talk about the the debate from last night? You want to start with No, that? We, let's, you know, so if you're listening to this, this is uh, the night after the second Republican presidential debate. And if you thought the first one was rough, well, let me just say, let me just say that when the, the debate ends on arguing over the curtains and trying to play survivor well what can i say we're a long ways away from the days of lincoln coolidge eisenhower and reagan we're we're used to arguing about about uh carpet and all sorts of things so that's that's true maybe maybe they should they needed they needed a baptist preacher moderating that thing last night because he has Mm. experience with such trifles needed a committee or something yeah so we want to start, first of all, um, we forgot to do this the last time, and that is that Jesse, a few weeks ago, uh, put a, because Jordan loves, to, you know, George Stefaniak lives to make pictures of <laughs> me and Jesse, especially me. They're and terrible. My, my candid moments on here. I think, I know, I, I used to be baffled why Jordan wanted this to be recorded on video and audio, and I know the reason now. So a few weeks ago, Jesse shared one of those captioned faces of me and asked the Twitter slash X audience to caption my face. So we'll go with a few that were mentioned. 
Uh, Jeff Kaufman said, I am sorry, but fried chicken is always better than ham. I definitely agree. Um, my friend David Sullivan said, Jake, I just don't feel like Baptist history is all that important. Um, Jesse's never said that to me, thankfully, so I wouldn't have to make I that. Never, I would never say that. Um, I did love that somebody said, quote, even I have questions about this Bama team this year. That was before the South Florida game. So uh, Man. we have even more questions. Uh, Jake Rainwater, my uh, – what, what can I call him? He's my alternative universe person, more diabolical version of me. Um, yeah. He said, you, you didn't bury the grape juice. Of course, <laughs> if you don't know that inside story, let me know. I'm sure you do. Um, I do agree with Noah York. In my heart is a burning hatred of popery. Yes. Um, great line from Jesse Parker down in Mississippi. I didn't choose the creamer for my coffee. The creamer chose me. And then finally, Jordan Senecal, who I used to, he doesn't work at the library up there in Canada anymore, but I used to say he was my Canadian alter ego because we're both JSs and worked at libraries at Baptist institutions. He said, quote, I can remember it like yesterday when I asked R. Albert Moeller Jr. into my heart. So, Hey, did we mention uh, Ben Stratton? Go, go ahead. What, what did Ben say? He, he put the Baptist flag up and said, I pledge allegiance to the Baptist flag. You know, somebody asked me, well, we're recording this um, a week from tomorrow or sat, we're recording, ugh, this is a Thursday night we're recording this. Look, folks, I've had Hebrew today. I've had Hebrew for seven weeks. I, I'm, I'm exhausted. Um, so we have fall break here at Southern next week. And so I will be heading to North Carolina. And I'm going to be uh, presenting three lectures at a Baptist History Conference at Brandon Askew's church down there in Henderson, North Carolina. And someone asked me what the lectures were. And I said, <laughs> I didn't have to create one. I'm just using the outline from the flag, the book, the blood, the blessed hope. And the great thing is I could just do that off the, the cuff. I really could, actually. And um, I'm sure Brandon would prefer that you not do that. Well, he's they've got some old some old time folks there. And um, I'm, I've told him that Sunday when I'm there, I, I want him to bring out some of those those good hymns. I'll fly away. I don't care if Dr. Wilsey says that it's a neo-gnostic song. Um, mm. you know. And by the way, speaking of Southern professors, let me say that, that Dr. Sean Wright would be very proud of me this evening. I am using uh, to support my little stand that I put my phone on here to record. I am using a book from Thomas Aquinas. And Richard Baxter, uh, two <laughs> people who are not in Dr. Wright's top 1,000 theologians. Mm. And um, I, I, I know that, that me and Jesse disagree. He thinks Richard Baxter is a great guy that's just misunderstood. And what is Arminianism but a form of popery? So, of course, he likes Thomas <laughs> Barnes. So. No, what I told you the other day was Baxter said what we needed, if we were to sort of, as our basic confession of faith was... Uh, the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. Because you you said something to me where you're kind of like that sounds good, and I said, well, you do know that that's yes, what the context. Baxter you know, said. I was really trying yeah. to incur I was trying to encourage Jesse, <laughs> and he brought discouragement into my my life. Well, I just wanted you to know and that the thing like, you well, were supporting, the thing you were supporting, is actually supported by Richard Baxter. I just wanted to make sure you knew that. We had we had we had uh, Pastor Robert Briggs from Emmanuel Baptist in Sacramento with us at RBC Louisville last Sunday, and he preached a, two excellent sermons. Uh, the Sunday night was on Revelation twelve, so I give kudos to somebody who's visiting who deals with a text like that, and he did a great job. And that morning he preached Acts two forty two through forty seven on the means of grace, and just a great mm -hmm. reminder. And he said that he's, he often encourages people, if you're discipling a, a, a new convert, that if, you were, if they were able to memorize the, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Apostles' Creed, they would have a good systematic theology in their heart and mind if they had no access to Scripture and they were in prison. And I just thought that was really profound and helpful. And so I, I wanted to share that with Jesse, and then he has to come in with that Baxterianism. And, um, you know, we all know that a broke clock is right twice a day. 
And Richard Baxter said, Jesus is Lord, I'm sure somewhere in his voluminous writings, but that doesn't mean that we go run to it. So. Yeah. I mean, Zach, Zach is working on antinomianism stuff and, and Abraham Booth. He's been sending me quotes from Richard Baxter and it just makes me want to vomit. And you've been, uh, and you've been putting those little hearts on there, clicking. No, clicking no, there. I've been sending the puke emoji face. Oh, well, so Jesse, wait, did you have a favorite of one of those uh, tweets? Did you, uh, you don't have to pick a favorite, but what um, did you have well, see, this puts me on the spot now. Okay. okay. I mean, I really, I mean, I got to chuckle. I mean, I probably chuckle the most. Pro well, probably on the, I pledge allegiance to the Baptist flag. Because, I mean, I have preached with that behind me before. I mean, that's true. <laughs> you know, this is true. I've, I've, I've had that. So, um, Did you read the one that said, uh, uh, moi, a landmark Baptist? Did you read that one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we th we appreciate the the audience participation in this. So I'm sorry, we forgot to uh, yeah. do this last time. I know. So let's um, let's see here, Jesse. Let let's talk about just what's happening in our lives, let's so to speak. Um. What are you reading of interest lately? Um, <laughs> I've, I've read quite a few good books recently. Well, Nine marks. Uh, well, let's do this since it's Baptistic. How about that? Okay. Not Baptistic, Congregationalist, ba Baptist. Yeah, yeah. Um, I read Nine marks has a, a new book that they put out uh, called Planting by Pastoring. And so I have been involved in church planting for the last seven years. And a lot of the church planting books that I've read or that have been recommended to me are just kind of like church growth books. It's like, here's how you get a bunch of people to show up at a grand opening service, or they some, some of them call it a launch service. Here's how you get a whole bunch of people to come to this stuff. And here's how you you know, communicate and follow up. And here's how you plan sermon series for, you know, people maybe who haven't been in church and things like that. And, and I found some value in some of those things. But I loved this book, uh, Planting by Pastoring, because the emphasis was, hey, you know, there are some things that are unique about church planting, but you need to think about a church plant as a, a, a church. And so if you're going to be a church planter, then you need to think about being a pastor. And so the emphasis was on, you know, preaching and the ordinary means of grace and discipleship and things like that. So um, that's a new book from Nine Marks, and uh, I would definitely recommend that. I've recent, this is not Baptistic, but I recently read Philip Yancey's memoir, uh, Where the Light Fell. Well, I didn't read it, actually. I listened to the audio book because he reads it. And um, it it kind of wrecked me a bit, but I don't I don't know that uh, that's something we want to talk about on this this podcast. How about you? Well, first of all, do audio books count? Yeah, I you know, that's a debate. Um, I, I don't know that I really care. I, I would not. I listen to certain types of books on on audio. Um, I've only recently started listening to audio books. Um, so do, do you want me to mention some of the other ones I've listened to? No. We'll keep that off the record. <laughs> okay. For your sake. And but mine. one of them was by, is by a, a former Baptist. Yeah, we'll keep that off the record. Okay, for for your sake and mine. Okay, we 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 are we already have we we already have been classified in some in some ways. We we don't want to add to to that. So, All right. we don't want people to think we're too too liberal on some things. Um, it wasn't it wasn't Bernie Sanders' latest book. Let me make that clear. Mm -hmm. That's not what no. Jesse was listening to. He's more of an it's Obama guy. Yes, um, it was so, actually a book about um, Abraham Lincoln, who had Baptist connections. John okay, Lincoln. yeah. So both 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 Jesse and I have recently read, and then there was light, um, which is John Meacham's recent biography of Lincoln, and I I enjoyed it much. It's kind of interesting to me. So I'm, I'm currently reading a book right now just for my own sake, 
that explores the new divinity movement and its impact on Baptist. And Lincoln's theology was hardly confessional orthodoxy. Uh, we, we would not say that. But he was raised in a basically a primitive Baptist church. So he's very much familiar with Calvinistic doctrine and the whole ethos of Baptist on the frontier, which is one re- which is why his opposition to slavery goes back to his childhood. His mm, father yeah. was opposed to slavery. A lot of those frontier Baptists were opposed to it. Yeah. And, you know, Lincoln was a politician. He's very pragmatic in, throughout his career on the slave issue. I don't know how, you know, just by putting myself in that p- time period, that was really the only way that you were going to have a chance, really, at elected office. In some ways, you had to be pragmatic. But one of the things that stood out to me the most, and this is not really a, a you know, I would say theological insight, but just who he was and how much we we miss this kind of humility in leaders is that after the Emancipation Proclamation and a little time, he has uh, Sojourner Truth visits him in the White House. And she thanked him for the Emancipation Proclamation and said that he was the greatest president who had ever lived because of what he'd done. And that he took the time not to relish in his, the praise given to him, or brag about himself, but to say, well, my predecessors tried. He extolled Washington and others and said, if they could have done it in their time, they would have. And I just think it's remarkable about, we live in a day now where it's very easy for you to diss your predecessors in a variety of contexts. Hmm. And to essentially present yourself as if you're that you are the savior, you know, I alone can make things happen. We've heard recent presidents say that. And Lincoln instead really shows a understanding of the office and, you know, the stewardship. And I do think we can make an application that all of us in our context, whether it's as members of a church whether it's a part of a certain theological tradition and stream, that we're not the first one in the in the in the link. We're not the first link, and that there's a lot that's been passed down to us, and we should seek to be good stewards and faithful to what's been given to us, and realize that those who went before us didn't get everything right, and we don't either. And those who come after us are going to be able to look at things and say, "Yeah, they didn't get that right." Yeah. Yeah, I thought it, I thought Meacham's uh, for for whatever people think of John Meacham, I thought his book was really balanced. Um, I, I thought the way that he presented Abraham Lincoln as a really complex figure uh, was was really good. But the but like you mentioned, the emphasis on him hearing anti slavery sermons um, in Baptist churches in Kentucky, I thought was really uh, intriguing. Um, I was I was really fascinated by that. Um, tell us uh, tell us a little bit about the new divinity, Jake. Uh, are the the Baptists uh, are they are the all the Baptist new divinity men, or what's what is all that about? I think some think they were. Um, I was I will Andrew say Fuller, Andrew Fuller a new divinity man. I don't think so. Okay. Um, I think. Well, let me just say this. I think setting aside the, the, the merits of that book or any other book, one thing that I, that's kind of stood out to me is two things. Number one, it really is hard to try to make the arguments for causation when we're talking about who influenced whom in history. Yeah, that's um, true. I think it's very difficult. I think I've, I've kind of, and I'm still learning and still being trained to, to, you know, to be a historian. But I think that I thought it was a lot easier to connect dots. I don't think so as much now. And uh, I think it's, Dr. Wright said this in class yesterday. He said, you've got to have 
really hard, consistent evidence that so-and-so really read and was changed and molded by another person. He said, you can't just look and say, well, they had him in their library. or He said, I have heretics in my library, and I've read them, and I hope they haven't influenced me. Um, you know, and I, I think it's harder, is my point. I, I think it's a lot harder mm. than, than maybe I, I used to think. The other thing is this. And I think, and I think a, a lot of our audience will appreciate this. So I'm going to put it in my context here. And I was talking to Zach about this earlier today. When I came to embrace the, the five points of Calvinism, I, I was almost led to, to, to imagine and believe that if I took John Calvin and John Owen and Jonathan Edwards and Martin Lloyd-Jones, they all believed exactly the same thing because they're Calvinists. You know, and so it's almost, you know, they all, you know, it's like they all believe the same thing. And um, <laughs> then when you start diving and reading, this stuff's messy. It's complex because everything that that's one thing I do appreciate from of this book is that, you know, there's a everyone's got a nuance somewhere. Mm. There, there's a there's a there's some shades in there that aren't really black and white, but they're varying degrees of gray. Mm. And um, and I think it's helpful. And, and Jesse and I have talked about this before. When you have convictional, confessional boundaries and beliefs in your own heart and mind, where you where you are settled, where Scripture teaches, and what is the most consistent application of the Bible. Then when you do history and stuff, it doesn't, it's not going to, you know, shatter you or you're not going to be afraid of following the evidence and looking at things and being able to say, you know, Mm -hmm. this person got that wrong. And, you know, I still appreciate and respect this individual, but I think they were off here. And I I think that that's being fair and being honest and and also saying there's a, these were human beings. I mean, if you and I were to sit down and somebody go through every major heading of systematic theology with us and then ecclesiology, I mean, what, what varying shades would we have that might even, I mean, I'm a second London guy. I think it's the best expression of scriptural truth, but I promise you that if I got, I, I, I am more convinced of this today than I was a week ago that I think that there is a sense in which what the confession teaches can't be argued. But I also think that depending on a person, you can articulate some things differently than others. And hmm. that doesn't make you um, unconfessional or it doesn't make you somehow, you know, opposed to it. And I don't know if any of that made sense, but I'm just trying to say that I think that Theology and history is comp- more complicated than we sometimes think. Yeah, but that that texture is what what actually makes, um, and in part, is kind of what makes it fun. Um, and or great, or in the words of Doctor Betts, my Hebrew professor, great sorrow. <laughs> no, no, what I, I mean, feel every day when we have. Well, so I mean, a couple of things. I read, you know, I read people that I respect and that I hold in in high esteem. Baptists, Calvinist Baptists, Arminian Baptists, um, you know, other maybe Congregationalists or Presbyterians, especially in the 17th century. And you can read things and think that's, that is incredible. I'd love to tweet that. And then you can read two pages later and think, Lord have mercy. I hope no one ever, (laughs) I hope no one ever reads that this guy wrote that. Um, You know, I, I, Jake and I were joking about something not long ago. I don't know. This is probably three or four months ago about something I was looking at, uh, that one of the signers of the, the first London confession had written. And then another that he had written like a a preface to, and it's the kind of thing where you're just thinking to yourself, that's, that's not exactly what I would have expected that this person would have done, or this person would have said. And so instead of papering over those things, I think recognizing that maybe you wish someone that you admire would have said something different, or maybe they would have said nothing at all. 
uh, is okay. You know, um, like you were saying a moment ago, Jake, our views on what we think scripture teaches are not dependent upon finding affirmation for those views in historical figures. It's nice where we find it. Uh, and, and it's important to explore the tradition, but it, but it, they're not dependent upon that. And I don't have to make historical figures say what I want them to say. Uh, I just, uh, I look for what's there and, uh, and there's something nice about that. Uh, whether, whether we always recognize it or not, if ever, if everyone just kind of regurgitated the exact same thing, I think we would lose something. Now I will say something you're not going to like when you were, when you were making that comment about, uh, about John Calvin and, uh, John Owen and Martin Lloyd Jones, I almost started to make an RT Kendall joke, but I, I thought for the love of, of Dr. Sean Wright, I would keep that to myself. So, yeah, please do. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, and, and that's one of the things I, I, I can say is Jesse sent me a few weeks ago, uh, a chapter, an essay that he has written on a free will Baptist theologian in general, in general atonement. And, um, I agree with it. But but what I appreciated, though, is that I that it was a well-written essay and made me have to go back and think through, again, just refreshing my own self about the issues. And I think that too often we, we retreat into our own small circle and really miss how it does sharpen us when we read others who we disagree with and do it fairly and charitably. Hmm. And I and I think almost we live in a very strange day where to be charitable and fair is somehow equated into, well, that means you endorse. And I just think that's a very bizarre place for us to be. Or that you're just soft, or that you're just soft, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a problem too. I I think that there's something wrong that prudence today equals softness. Yeah. And and, and it explains so much of where we are. And, 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 And I'll even go a step further. Let's go ahead. It's late tonight. Let's stir the pot up here a little bit. You know, a lot of people who want to be known today and who are, who major on setting things on fire and having the, the little clickbait stuff. There's a reason why they have to reinvent themselves so much. Why they've got to, you know, my pastor this past Sunday said, beware the men whose ministries are based on fear Hmm. and that you've got to listen to them and trust Hmm. them. Um, that there, that there is no substance there. There's a lot of sizzle, but we call this Baptist buffet. Let me tell you something. I'll enjoy hearing a steak sizzle and smelling it. But you know what? Hearing it and smelling it is not the same as eating it. I want to eventually eat that sucker. <laughs> and so there's a lot of people who've got the pop and the sizzle, but they ain't got no meat. They have nothing. Yeah. They may have they they may have a small house salad but they don't have the meat and the potato. And that's one of the things that was interesting in this class with Dr. Wright about Calvin, whether you agree with Calvin or not, there's a reason we are still reading him, Hmm. learning from him, discussing him. There's a lot of contemporaries of his day. We don't read. They haven't, they're they're, they're not really read. Um, Can can I warm your, can I warm your, your little Calvinist heart? Um, Well, I think it's a big heart, but go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> so in class the other day, I, I just, uh, I, I want people to, to, to know that stuff like this actually happens in class the <laughs> other day, uh, I'm teaching a biblical interpretation class and I had them read commentaries on the same text from different eras. And I had them, uh, read Calvin in class. So, uh, you know, here I am, Arminian Baptist teaching at a free will Baptist school. I let him read the Calvin commentary, told him Calvin was a good exegete, you know, good commentator. So there you go. Also, I sent you that, I sent you that chapter because, and because I I wanted not to convince you of general atonement, although that would be great too, but, uh, but to, for you to tell me 
whether or not you thought that was a fair representation of well, one of, of Andrew Fuller, but also of, of maybe a Calvinist view of certain things that I was discussing. So I wanted to know, you know, do you, do you think that this is an unfair representation or misrepresentation of, of views? So anyways, that's part of the reason I sent it to you. He's not telling y'all that in his class, when he pulls down the screen for the projector, there's the picture of Calvin where they've thrown the darts at him. You know, yeah. In, in between. No, I pull that. I pull it down just, just, you know, slightly and then it recoils back up and mm-hmm. then we throw the darts. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's so, cool. um, so let's kind of, let's, let's end this with just, you know, something, some fun here. Um, Jesse likes coffee. I like food. I'd rather spend money on food than coffee. But anyway, um, to each his own. Um, so, so Jesse, tell us what's been a good coffee that you've had. I don't even know how to ask the question. What's a good coffee you've had lately? Um, my favorite coffee, there, there's a lot, I will say there's a lot of good coffee in Louisville. There's a lot of good coffee in Nashville a lot of good coffee shops, but I actually buy coffee from a place in um, Savannah, Georgia called Perk Coffee, and they sell it at local grocery stores here. So that's how I get it. Sometimes I order it from them, but my favorite coffee from them is an Ethiopian coffee. I like the more floral, fruity coffees that you can taste, Jake, if you have a refined palate and you don't do half cream, half coffee, you can actually get a sense that not all coffees taste the same. Some coffees are are not not exactly like the others. You know, yeah, like, I've been, I've been like your place refined place. palate. It's like your place. refined palate when yeah. I take you to those Cajun restaurants in uh, that are in Middle Tennessee. I, I'll just say that I, I've been to a place before. I won't name where. It's been several years ago, but I've been to a place that was trying to tell me put it on your palate and you'll taste this and that and. I, I didn't taste it. Um, no, no, I, you may not hold on, but hold on now. You may not say that with coffee, but I've seen you turn up your nose at food. So th- this is what I'm saying. You you just haven't acquired. Where did you? I, I have always. I have. I have always. I've eaten everything that was put on the plate before me. You. <laughs> I didn't say you didn't eat it. I didn't say you didn't eat it. I just said you made a. You, you know, want? You asked me, and I told you. And that place isn't even a Cajun restaurant anymore. It tells you all you need to know. No, it's um, like a it's best, it closed. It's like yeah, a ramen the, restaurant. The best place that Jesse has ever taken me to go oh. eat anywhere. I'm kind of interested to hear this. Um, was when he took me to, and this is a true story. I want people to know how big hearted Jesse is. The best food I've ever had is when we were at ETS and he got me a cold sandwich out of the vending machine. <laughs> that, that's 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 the kind of guy he is. No, the truth the truth the truth is is that the best place he's ever taken me was Monell's down there oh. in Nashville. Mm. No, and I mean, the fried chicken. Mm. What did they have when we were? They, they had the um. What was it? The, was it pork chops or meatloaf or something yeah, else? Yeah, they too? they usually do. They have sometimes they have all three. Yeah, uh, they'll do I mean, three meats and then these the 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 the, the green beans. The potatoes and gravy, mm. the bread, mm. and then they brought, what did we, what was it? Was it banana pudding? Well, they have, I don't know if you were a fan of this, but they have like a corn pudding that they bring with the yeah. meal. Yeah. But, uh, but then they have a banana pudding sometimes for dessert. If you are ever in the Nashville area, you need to go to Monell's. Always good. It, now it is family uh, seating and dining, so they sit you either with people that you don't know and you pass the food around the table like you would with, with your family, or if you have enough people to fill up the table, then it'll be just your family. But you definitely need to try Monel's for sure. Yeah, cool. You know, there's a, there's a thing people may have seen before. It's, it's the test on uh, how Southern are you. Um, corn pudding's on there. I don't care about corn pudding. Um, I'm not a turnip greens guy. Oh. I, I, you know, people, you know, my, my mom and my grandma... Yeah, they 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 chast, I, you know. But the, the truth of it is, is you know, if it's green, I don't care much for it, except if it's fried. I love fried okra. Um, oh, no, I like I mean, fried okra. And um, what was I going to say? I also 
don't I don't like cold salads that have a reputation in the South. Pea salad, corn salad, no. Potato salad? No. I don't like potato salad. Law? It depends on where I am. I'm not a big, I, I cannot stand coleslaw that's swimming in mayonnaise. I cannot stand that at all. How about, um, how about okra and tomatoes? Like okra and stewed tomatoes. It's okay. My dad loves it. My dad mm. absolutely loves So let me take, take our listeners down to Gulfport when I was a kid. We had this place called Homestead. It's not there anymore. Sam sits on its property now. Sam's oh, we're now. close too. And, um, and Homestead, though, was this country buffet place. Excellent fried chicken. Excellent fried catfish. S- Friday's was seafood. And folks, this isn't Golden Corral seafood, okay? Seafood, which is all Jesse's ever had. Um, <laughs> seafood at, in, at home <laughs> on a buffet came from the Gulf, all right? So it's real shrimp caught and fried. It all tastes the same. No. No, no. <laughs> let me take red lobster and Gulf shrimp are not the same thing. It's all the same. And, um, but they had stewed okra and tomatoes. My dad would get that. And they also had these, this, 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 it was chicken and vegetables they had together and they, and he put it in a bowl and all. And I, I, I loved it. What's mm. your favorite coffee place in Louisville? Let's put you on the spot here. Favorite coffee place in Louisville. That, that is tough. Um, I like things about Quills. I like things about Center Goss. I do like what what it's off. It's near um, Poplar Level or Eastern Parkway over there. That Center Goss that's next to the Donut Place. Um, totally blanking on the name of the Donut Place. Zach, what's the, that place? It's by the bookstore. By the Book Nook. The Book Nook. What's the coffee? What's the Donut Place? The donut place. Nords. 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 I'm going to tell you, if you can get a cup of coffee at Center Goss, grab a donut at Nords. Nords has that maple bacon thing, isn't it? Yeah. And then hit the book nook. So, so in that situation, the the coffee's great, but then we're, we're only making it better. And those are literally, you know, there's a little side street in between, but those are literally side by side. All three of those. You'll usually see some interesting characters down there too. Um, so, so, um, what, what, um, Jesse is more of a world traveler than I am. (laughs) So I've only flown twice in my life. And, um, so I'm going to North Carolina next week. What's some good, what's, what's some good food memories you have from North Carolina? Oh, um, well, I like, um, you know, it's a chain, but I like Smithfield's barbecue. It's a great Great barbecue place. You can get a barbecue pulled pork and fried chicken on the same pl- plate with sides. It's good. Yeah, that sounds like the marriage supper of the lamb right there. I'm telling you, it's uh, it's really solid. Um, the Brunswick stew is really good there too. You have to try that out. Now, what I want something I want to try is a place that Jordan says is a really good barbecue place called Prime, which is apparently right by his house. But I was over there with my uncle last time I was in that area. My uncle actually pastors a church uh, near Jordan's house and near that barbecue place. And he said it was like $25. And so, you know. We know that Jordan has expensive taste. (laughs) He only shops at Trader Joe's. Oh, well, hey, since I go to Dollar Tree for groceries. If we're giving food recommendations, if you're ever at Trader Joe's, here's what you need to get. Don't worry about anything else. You need to go locate the dark chocolate peanut butter cups. They're like Reese's, but dark chocolate at Trader Joe's. You need, Jake, Trader Joe's close to campus. You got to go. And how they much are, are those? $25 for No, five? They're, like, they're like $5. Yes, you got you to gotta, you gotta cut it out. They're like $5. Maybe five five ninety five. I don't know. Something like that. Okay. La- la- last, last, last question. And this was actually a discussion that we were having amongst ourselves up here this week because we were bemoaning the fact that we really don't think there is a place like this in Louisville. So I'm going to ask you, Jesse, what's the best fast food biscuit? Oh, 
Fast food biscuit? Yeah. Hardee's. Best bi- Hardee's? Okay. Easy. Right. Not even close for me. Okay. I don't think there's anything even in the ballpark. Yeah, I we have we have you know it's funny back home we have a Hardee's they do way more business at breakfast than lunch or dinner. I would there. only go there for breakfast. Yeah. By the way, let's see how let's see if, if Je- do you remember Jesse when Hardee's sold fried chicken? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I remember that. Um, yeah. We don't really have one near here, but I've had it before and I love it. And I will probably make sure that I stop because I know I'll go through buy one next week. And that's Bojangles. I love the their Cajun Filet chicken biscuit. Oh, wait, you like the chicken biscuit at Bojangles? Yeah. The chicken, well, I agree with that. The chicken biscuit at Bojangles, I like that it's spicy. That kind of adds a little something to it. And I know you can get the spicy chicken biscuit at, at Chick-fil-A. But then the chicken is, it must be twice the size of the biscuit. You know, yeah. you feel like you got a nice amount of chicken where sometimes I go to Chick-fil-A and I feel like I got a, like two chicken nuggets on a chicken biscuit or something. And, uh, and that's disappointing. Do you like the Bowberry biscuits at uh, Bojangles? Have you had those? I've never had that. It's a blueberry biscuit with icing on it. You know, well, that, that would be great with a cup of coffee. With, with cream in two, it? Two cream and two sugar. My favorite coffee place here in Louisville probably still is Fonte's because that's where they have the cookie crumble frappuccino. <laughs> and let me tell you something. I haven't had one in a long time because they're expensive. But cookie crumble frappuccino. Oh, oh it's it's... <laughs> That's a milkshake. No, it has coffee in it. You like milkshakes. Frappuccino equals coffee. Hey, here's something we can definitely agree on, I think. Okay, quality of food and price, best fast food burger. Oh, that's easy, Culver's. It's Culver's. It's yeah. easily Culver's. Folks, you can go to get the basket from Culver's. I mean, two pa- two patties, fries, and a drink for under $11. That, I mean, and then go get, now you can't be like my buddies. They get the too big of the, the concrete mixer, but just yeah. all you need is the mini. That's plenty hey, look, of ice cream. If you're on a, if you're on a tight budget, uh, you can go kids meal for like six something. You get burger, fries, drink, and a scoop of custard with a topping. Jesse knows this because he eats his kids ice cream. He's told me this. Yes. He calls uh, it, he calls it the dad tax. I, I didn't come up with that, but I do, I dad tax every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. We, every now and then more than now than the then. Yeah. It was a little weird though. A couple weeks ago when my oldest said something like, don't tread on me. It was a little, that was a little strange, but you know. mm, he's, he's getting wise, <laughs> smart young man. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you enjoyed this Baptist buffet where we talked about lots of different things and we hope that you enjoyed it a little different or the next time we'll dig into some more shall we say substantive historical and theological topics but until then stay baptist my friend Mm -hmm.